Namaste, and welcome to our continuing series, Interviews with Orvillians. Today we have Holger back with us on music, and this will continue for some time. So we welcome all musicians, all lovers of music, to see these videos, because they are they're very important for the future. Today we will talk about a number of things, and I begin with a quotation of a question from Amal Kiran to Sri Aurobindo, and we'll take it from there. Once you have said Goethe not being one of the world's absolutely supreme singers, who are these then? Homer, Dante, Shakespeare, Valmiki, Kalidasa, and what about Aeschylus, Virgil, and Milton? I'm sure you know many of these, Holger. Then he says, I suppose all the names you mention, except Goethe, can be included. Or if you like, you can put them all, including Goethe, in three rows. That is, okay, Sri Arbindo says this. First row, Homer, Shakespeare, Valmiki. Second row, Dante, Kalidasa, Aeschylus, Virgil, Milton. Third row, Goethe. And there you are. To speak less flippantly, the first three have at once supreme imaginative originality, supreme poetic gift, widest scope, and supreme creative genius. Each is a sort of poetic demiurge who has created a world of his own. Dante's triple world beyond is more constructed by the poetic seeing mind than by this kind of elemental demiurgic power. Otherwise, he would rank by their side. The same with Kalidasa. Aeschylus is a seer and creator, but on a much smaller scale. Virgil and Milton have a less spontaneous breath of creative genius. One or two typal figures accepted. They live rather by what they have said than what they have made. Holger, we have gone from a world that lived by the objective senses, the five senses, and humanity is now entering a world of the subjective. Can we apply Sri Aurobindo's qualifications to music? For example, in your field, the violin. Can we speak of greatest violinists or the capacity of violinists, the quality, the inspiration? Tell us what you feel. If we are going with such a list of the uh, poets, first we have to understand that those poets are, all of them, um, creators, whereas violinists, generally speaking, are playing creations of Ye others. Yes. So in any case, any list would limp very much compared to that. If any, we should put composers there, not violinists. Ah. I have a, a very great respect for certain musicians that are executing works of others. Like we spoke the other day when we speak about pianists, we see, seem to have the same liking. So we would like... Uh, both of us like Dino Lipati and don't like Glenn Gould that much. Now, Glenn Gould, I mention here because it's out of the question that he is one of the greatest pianists of the 20th century. Yet, we both like him not that much. We respect him, I guess, 
we should, <laughs> in any case, yes. it's unbelievably uh, clear how he plays and gets all the lines equally. It's right. But at the end of it, I feel I have heard uh, Glenn Gould. And when I listen to Dino Lipati, I don't have that feeling at the end. I don't have the feeling I heard Dino Lipati the great. No, I heard a piece of music. And even that, I forget about the composer. It becomes just this, this flow of structure and, uh, and, and, and emotion and insight. So, the two of us tend, when we have that kind of experience, to rate, as with Dino Lipati, to rate that higher. We just have more liking for that where the person disappears rather than appears in a very impressive, shining way. Then we had that American pianist who won the prize in Russia for the Rachmaninoff. Big, okay. big, tall Texan guy. Okay. Don't know. I, I can't remember his name at the moment, but mm. it'll come back. Mm. But I have felt very often uh, a great beauty in uh, Richter. Mm. What do you feel about him? Very much like uh, uh, like Dino Lipati. Ah. When I see him playing what he plays fantastically, like Schubert, then then it's not even Schubert there anymore. It's it's the for me then it's it's just the chord and this the material of the music that is becoming all. And that's what I love. And it goes well together with an interview uh, w w with him, a whole movie, uh, when he's old and ca couldn't play anymore. And at the end of that movie, he said, into the camera, I don't like myself. And I was so touched by that. Yeah. But people have to understand it in the right way. Exactly. It's not a psychological problem he has here. It's something he is not attracted to. But Karayan is at all moments attracted to that, to Karayan. I would assume, I didn't know him personally, but from the feeling I get when I listen or see him, that's the feeling I get. See him especially, I especially, think. Especially, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And for and well now we're into uh, conductors but Fort Wengler. Yeah. I just saw uh, a very rare video of him conducting. Quite special. I will <laughs> send it to you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so we get it doesn't matter whether we speak about poets or whether we speak about uh, violinists or uh, conductors or conductors composers. doesn't matter. Um, it seems to be that can we say the magic word ego here uh, when the ego gets more in the foreground in the creation of something? I would agree. We, it's just so overused, the word, and so extremely misunderstood. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that I put a little hesitation on, on mm -hmm. using that word. Uh, but somehow we have to uh, uh, grab this. Uh, so then suddenly the whole art world and also the rest of it is more like two grades. Is it more in this direction or is it more in that direction? Uh, I Maybe it's personality, which is also ego. <laughs> Mostly, yes. The, per the personality But of someone. For example, we could have someone who plays beautifully And I have seen uh, this Chinese fellow play beautifully at times. Mm. And yet, one gets the feeling of the showman. You speak of Lang Lang. Lang Lang. Yes, yes I'm speaking of Lang Lang. Yes. 
Exactly. One, you get that. And there is great success in that because people like to identify with this. And I have not a, um, a disregard for people like that. It also say, for example, um, if you take a rock guitar player called Steve Vai, one of the greats, fantastic. He has supreme command over his instrument and all the things you can do with it. He knows exactly how to stand to get the right response from the amplifier. It's wonderful. He also has nice long hair and when he plays he has a fan blowing his hair so it really looks fantastic. It is quite clear what, he, uh, what his message is about. It's about him. But he does it better than anybody else. So I have admiration for that. I yes. have respect for that. Yeah. Yeah? Yes. It's just not filling my days to be so attracted to that. I see it and then I said, man, he knows his job. <laughs> so good. I felt that way about Pletnev when I first heard him do the, uh, um, the, the gates of Kiev. The... Mussorgsky. Mussorgsky, yeah. Mussorgsky. Pictures at an exhibition. Mm -hmm. And my friend Gilles said, there's too much rubato. I don't like it. Okay. So, how do you feel about rubato? Well, it cannot be said gen answered generally because it depends where and in what yes. music or even speaking. Of course, rubato creates some kind of drama, which it is therefore uh generally uh and then overused and uh, if you overuse it in in uh, romantic music or or you can't hardly overuse it uh, it's allowed it's required mm -hmm. and when you do that in baroque music it is a totally different thing so it's like vibrato on the violin. It's not a good or a bad thing. It's a device. So if you play tango non-vibrato, you fail. Ah. But yes. if you play some uh, Telemann uh, solo sonata for violin and you do it nicely on the G-string with a lot of vibrato, you also fail. Fail? Why? Not that it is not allowed. Anybody can do anything. That's totally okay. But there is in a composition, hopefully, an inborn power. An, an, an inborn, yeah, maybe one can say that, an inborn power. And uh, like on a wave in the ocean. So as a surfer, you can go wherever you want. But if you want to ride the wave and use the power of the wave, then you have to ride in a very specific way. So you're a good surfer, surfer if you can um, ride long and elegantly on that wave and fast and whatnot. I'm not a surfer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, while you are free to go wherever you want at the end where you can rise, ride safely and, and uh, without getting wet and uh, no danger, that's the end of the wave. Or you're going tubing and, and then it's life dangerous and exciting. So this is determined by the shape and the size and the speed of the wave. It's not something you can determine. So when you are playing a piece, the piece is like the wave. It gives you something, some energy. And if you are riding against that energy, you're not getting the best out of it, let's say. The most exciting out of it. So that would happen if you play with a lot of vibrato and uh, on nicely up in the higher uh, um, positions of the violin, you play a Bach solo sonata. You're not getting it. With vib vibrato. Yes, mm -hmm. or the art of the fugue. While Bach, for example, did not specify with which instruments you should play that. You can play that on the organ or you can, you can play that on any instrument. 
that has four, it's a four, so you have to have four lines possible, otherwise right. not. So he didn't write it, uh, it for string quartet or for orchestra or for organ. He just wrote the notes. So you are free to play it with whatever instrument. Even in terms of speed, Bach allows a greater variation than many other compositions, which is actually very fascinating, that you can play a Bach piece in many different speeds and they all work. Hmm. Whereas other pieces, uh, it's more restricted. You play them in a wrong tempo, the wave doesn't lend its energy. Yeah. Mm. Mozart, for example, if, if you would play, like I did as a child, uh, the E minor violin sonata. It's pretty, but it's not the energy of that piece, which is... Which is driving forward. But because it's amicable, Mozart is kind of always amicable, um, you can slouch it down and don't realize it. But once you play it in the right tempo, you know the big difference. And that is with Bach not that much, uh, mm -hmm. I feel. Strange, but when I was singing in Manhattan, New York City, and surrounding areas, I love Schubert songs, hmm. but I also like Hugo Wolf. Okay. And I don't know why. He seemed to break out of a mold or out of a frame into a different area of sound. And some of his pieces, so beautiful. I don't know him well, so uh, we can uh, thrive yeah. on a discussion here, but maybe we can go to we can go to how subjective our uh, perception I think this is very important of music and yes. art in general mm -hmm. is and has to be and uh, why this list of greatness of pianists or violinists or composers does not really make much sense. Mm -hmm. I can say, I think without doing Steve Vai any harm, I can say about him what I said before. Um, and I will have still full respect for that. But... But we could not say that he is a very uh, raw, fresh inventing uh, rock guitarist. That, that is not what we see here. So we cannot, maybe, we cannot say that Schubert is a better composer than Hugo Wolf. I, can, I can't say that now because I don't know Hugo Wolf very well. But And we have Schumann, but, Mozart, for the Yes, but these are all... Now, you say that from a perspective of a singer. Yes, only from a perspective of a singer. I'm trying to see it from the perspective of a creator. So, there are many other things, as in the uh, beginning uh, quote of Sri Aurobindo, when he says, when one could put different categories... Now, he doesn't put the category there uh, of a poet where he doesn't rhyme well or where, the, where, the, uh, where there are like technical flaws or weaknesses. We have to assume when we make such a list of composers that they all know their trade, which for a long while was in the focus and was good enough, especially in the Baroque times when the 
the aim of being an artist was not to create something new. It was not to create something very personal. You could do, but this is not, this is, the aim is to fulfill the law in the most elegant way. And Stravinsky said that, who was it, Respighi, or he said he didn't write 300 symphonies, he wrote one symphony 300 times. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that's, that's uh, almost sounding like a joke and slightly arrogant, but only mm. from the point of view of a 20th century composer. Ah. Yeah? So, the spirit of the times requires the artist or writer to do what he does in a particular way. And the spirit of the times at Beethoven times was to shift from a Baroque idea of gracefully fulfilling a purpose to an individual search, like we have in Goethe's Faust. You know, this is like, it became like proverbial, the, the Faustic urge of the human being. I want to know what holds together the world in its innerst. You know, this is the beginning of his large, mo long monologue in the beginning. I, I don't really think Bach thought much about that. Not even Mozart very much. No, this actually starts mm -hmm. later as a, as a mankind project. And then great artists with super high skills like Beethoven, they catch up, that, they, they catch that and ride this wave. When they criticized Bach, I think he said, I thought I was writing for the divine. <laughs> Quite surely he did, but that everyone could say. Everyone mm. can say mm. that that this is. But but which divine? That one of sixteen hundred, or that one of eighteen hundred, or that of the twenty-first century? Interesting. That is very important. So, when Beethoven comes on, would it be possible that there was a breakthrough also? Yes, that's where, that's where this comes. That's where it comes. Yes, because it was important to write from the individual point of view and then go as divine or as uh, universal, rather, uh, than, uh, as possible. And that, what, that is what he managed and maybe earlier than others and maybe better than others and that makes him the towering figure among other composers who tried. I would have to say that in the late quartets mm. he certainly did it. Yeah, because he goes into something which goes even beyond the individual then. So his main task would have been to achieve uh, 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 this individual uh, formulation that he managed, but in the late quartets he goes actually in something where I sometimes think he doesn't know himself where he is trying to reach, because it's in a way not even yet come down. It's a 20th century music. Yes. Without certain, of course, without certain uh, 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 devices, techniques that only came in in the 20th century, but the, the thrive to, that almost going into the material of the music entirely without the singable, emotional, amicable thing. So he, he jumps over the romantic. Yes. Yes, he did. Yeah. That, that's, that's quite fascinating and maybe also unique. And Bach does not attempt that ever, I would say. He is always... In this, um, in this completely fascinating 
mechanics of the rules and how he can how he can make this so unbelievable special and and artful from all points of view you want to look at it's always this fascinating crystal that's why he is i think also so universally loved because at this perfect fulfillment of the I don't know what. Um, he can be admired from a 21st century point of view equally than from a any other place. Mm. It seems to be beyond the times, but it is not. It is the times that dictated him that, and Tillemann tried the same. He just maybe didn't manage that skillful, although he is also very skillful. Yeah. Hmm. So when we think of new music, oh, that's a subject I'd like to next time uh, keep for the next time. <laughs> There's so much there. Yes, true. But I, I would like to ask you about a couple of conductors because uh, I know that Silibidake is severely criticized for his criticisms of other composers, <laughs> and yet he had something that was almost spiritual to me in his conducting. Yeah, for me, not almost. For me, spiritual. Okay. Uh, I, because, see, initially you said there was the kind of, um, you placed the five senses to objective. Yeah, that And was science at that time also. Yes. If we can see it, touch it, feel it, blah, blah, blah. blah. Exactly. It's and, real. And then we put the not five senses that would be the emotions, we put that to the side of subjective. Mm -hmm. I think... No, objective. I no, mean, the emotions to subjective. And the direct perception okay. of the five senses to objective. To objective. Okay. objective. Got it. Yeah. This is how it's generally done. Mm -hmm. Colloquially speaking. Okay. And I think it's a mistake. I do too. I think the direct perception is extremely subjective. Agree. We come, actually, we cannot see anything objective. We can create, after the fact, an appearance of objectivity by I hear what you say, I hear what that person says, so we can extrapolate some objectivity that none of us can actually think, see, perceive as that what it claims to be the objective thing. Like in that thing where there's this elephant in the dark room and people go in, the one feels the trunk and says, oh, it's a snake and so on. This famous teaching story. Mm -hmm. And why is that nice and works as a story? Because we know what an elephant is. But they don't. And this is what has to dawn to us that we do not know ever the divine or all of these things. We do not know how Auroville should be. In our present state of we consciousness. Do, we do not. And in a next state of consciousness, we will know certain things, but other things we will still, again, not know. And while Shirobindo talks about that often, because it's beyond the mental, we act, I would say, unfortunately, as if, this is not the case, as if we know exactly how things should be. We just have to behave right. We have to make this and these kind of roads circular in and so on, stuff like that. It's obvious. There it's written. And then we have to play Bach like this. It's obvious. And if you play Charlie Parker, you have to do this. It's a misconception. Yes. We are trying to speak about how I hear Beethoven late quartets and you hear 
And if we feel some similarity, there is a smile in us coming up and a kind of friendship and so on. But, but this is just because what you see and what I see has a similarity. It doesn't have to do anything with necessarily with what Beethoven sees. Leave alone those energies that are beyond you, me and Beethoven. And the hope or announcement of Sri Aurobindo of a coming subjective age would be a general understanding of the subjectivity of everything, especially the so-called objective world. It really appears only so. So how can we struggle about whether this is a good chair or a good violinist? Nothing to say about that. Only thing I can say, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> mm. We've talked before, I think, about Mother listening to all kinds of rock and roll. She did. I didn't know. And she says, they are standing on the threshold, but they don't know yet how to cross over. Yeah. How beautiful. Nice. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And look forward to seeing you next time. With pleasure. Namaste all.